Hey yo, Brian here. Welcome and thanks for tuning into my channel where I talk about eye-catching art, eye-catching things, and people-centered politics. The kiddos and I were having an outdoor painting session, and as we were painting, it made me think about the fall. I know summer's not over yet, but while you enjoy time-lapse video of us painting, I wanted to share some thoughts on kids going back to school during a pandemic. Stay tuned. <laughs> With less than a couple of weeks to go before the start of the upcoming school year here in Ontario, many people are understandably anxious, nervous, concerned, and left with lots of questions. Is it safe to go back? Should we risk it? What exactly are the government and the school boards planning to do to keep students and staff safe? How? What happens if someone tests positive? What if there's an outbreak? I'm sure that these along with a slew of other questions have been in the minds of parents, education workers, and students alike. But before we tackle these questions, let's rewind a few months back and talk about key issues stemming from the cuts to education and the teacher strikes in Ontario to set the context straight and highlight an education system already in a dire situation prior and intensely worsened by the pandemic. For much of the 2019-2020 school year, education workers and students in elementary and high schools across the province were protesting Premier Doug Ford's budget cuts to the public education system, which have also consequently led to the teacher strikes. A vast majority of the public supported the protests to stop these cuts and increase investment in our students and teachers, but came bargaining time to renew teachers' contracts, unions were yet again faced by the Ford government's anti-worker laws, which a year before had legislated a cap on wage increases for all public sector workers at only 1% for three years. Teachers were bargaining for a mere 2% wage increase to keep up with the rate of inflation, but this law directly infringes on unions' collective bargaining rights and laid an uneven playing field from the get-go. Then, amidst the lockdown, the government and school boards were pushed to reach a tentative agreement, meaning deals have come out, but union members have yet to vote on the terms and conditions. Oh, and by the way, this 1% wage cap also affects frontline healthcare workers, many of whom have not even received any pandemic pay as promised by the Ford government due to unclear and strict eligibility requirements. In contrast to capping education and healthcare workers' wages, the Toronto Police Services were given a whopping 3.9% raise for 2020 over their 2019 budget. I say, and many people would agree, that this is our tax money ill spent. Jumping forward to current times, the Toronto District School Board recently submitted a back-to-school plan calling for smaller class sizes, more teachers to allow for social distancing by staggering classes into separate cohorts, and less class time along with health and safety protocols, but was rejected by Premier Ford saying that it is too generous to teachers and doesn't give enough in-person class time to students. So what does the provincial government's back-to-school plan look like? Well, in a nutshell, they are proposing full-time classes for elementary students five days a week and will remain as a single cohort, including recess and lunch breaks. Class sizes will remain at the mandated maximum levels in place before the COVID-19 outbreak at 29 students. High school students will attend school in alternating days in cohorts of 15, but ultimately parents can opt their children out of in-person classes. Students in grades 4 and 12 will be required to wear non-medical masks or face coverings, while students grade 3 and younger will be encouraged but not required to wear masks. Student seating arrangements will be assigned. Students living in the same households will be seated together in school buses with seating arrangements also being assigned a tract. These are preventative measures, but what happens if someone is infected? The government has laid out guidelines for surveilling, assessing, and diagnosis of possible infection, and steps to take in various scenarios if teachers, other staff, students, bus drivers, or parents get sick, as well as case and outbreak management and contact tracing. As with workplaces, if someone gets sick with a virus, has had contact or lived with someone infected, they are to stay home in isolation, get tested if they haven't already, quarantine for 14 days, and so on. Check out links in the description below for the complete plans and guidelines. And how much is the whole operation going to cost? Kablam! You might want to pause the video for this. Here's a breakdown of the government's $309 million budget. I personally think that it's too soon to send students and education workers back and that all this money to reopen the schools across the country could help to maintain the Canada Emergency Relief Fund for a bit longer. All across the board, the pandemic has exposed and worsened long-existing inequities in labor, education, housing, and healthcare, 
and has made the need for people-first programs more undeniably clear. But even with Premier Ford's push to reopen schools, much like his economy-first mentality in reopening businesses, he still refuses to budge and act upon pretty obvious and sound safety measures to better protect the health and safety of students and staff by hiring more teachers, reduce class sizes, and invest in leasing an extra space as teachers have been asking for all along. A stern reminder to Premier Ford that our communities are watching, the future generation is watching, and will remember your actions during these extraordinary times. There is no going back to normal, what we have to strive for now is creating a new and better normal.